sermon lesson this morning comes from Matthew chapter 9. If you would please uh, stand with me for the reading of God's Word. While he was saying these things to them, behold, a ruler came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. Jesus rose and followed him with his disciples, and behold, a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for twelve years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. For she said to herself, If I only touch his garment, I will be made well. Jesus turned, and seeing her, he said, Take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. And when Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, Go away, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. And when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl arose. And the report of this went through all the district. And as Jesus passed on from there, two blind men followed him, crying aloud, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he entered the house, the blind, man, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, may it be done to you. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus sternly warned them, See that no one knows about it. But they went away and spread his fame throughout all that district. And as they were going away, behold, a demon-oppressed man who was mute was brought to him. And when the demon had been cast out, the mute man spoke. And the crowds marveled, saying, Never was anything like this seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, He casts out demons by the prince of demons. This is the gospel of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word, for the gospel, for the good news of Jesus. We thank you that he has power even over death and the grave that he can heal heal our ills, transform our lives and our bodies. We thank you for these wonderful miracles, and we ask that you would uh, speak to us now through these stories, through these accounts, that we might be transformed by your Holy Spirit. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So I think uh, many of you know that well, The Princess Bride is one of my favorite movies. It's, it's maybe one of the most quotable movies of all time. Uh, and I've, I've certainly talked about different scenes before, but I don't think I've ever talked about this one. It's, it's, one, of my, it's one of my favorites. It's that scene when uh, Wesley, the man in black, is dead, and they carry him. Well, does it carries him. They take him to Miracle Max uh, to, you know, See if he can bring him back to life. And, of course, that's uh, Miracle Max's Billy Crystal, which just, you know, it's a given that's going to be funny, right? And so the, they're inside. He's dead on the table. And Max is talking with Inigo Montoya. And he says, you got any money? And Inigo says, 65. We don't even know what that means, but evidently it's not a lot because he's, oh, I've never worked for so little, except once, and that was a very noble cause. Oh, this is noble, sir. His wife is crippled. His children are on the brink of starvation. Sheesh, are you a rotten, rotten liar. I need some help avenging my father murdered these 20 years. Your first story was better. (laughs) He probably owes you money, huh? Where's, Where's the bellows? I'll ask him. He's dead. He can't talk. Woohoo! Look who knows so much now. It just so happens that your friend here is mostly dead. Please open his mouth. And then he takes the bellows and, you know, sticks them in and starts pumping him up. <laughs> There's a big difference between mostly dead and all dead. Mostly dead is slightly alive. With all dead, well... I, with all dead, there's only one thing usually you can do. Oh, what's that? Well, go through his clothes and look for loose change. 
And of course, you know, it goes on from there. The wife gets involved. There's the whole true love argument. And he goes on to revive him, and they all live happily ever after, right? It's, it, we get to a good ending. But that discussion of how dead someone might or might not be always kind of amused me, partly because it's Billy Crystal and partly because the idea of mostly dead is just sort of funny anyway. So today we're looking at kind of another rapid-fire string of miracles. And like I said, Matthew tends to do this. It just kind of compresses them really tight, runs them all together. And in this one, it begins with a revivification uh, miracle. Well, actually, it's one that gets interrupted. But Jesus brings a little girl that has died back to life. And there's that other healing that's squeezed in. But there's, there's actually a debate, right, uh, when he goes to heal her about how dead she is. You know, Jesus is sort of siding with Max. <laughs> She's mostly dead. <laughs> um, as, you know, as crazy as that seems. Uh, and then from there, we get these other miracles, right? He, uh, after he revives a little girl, then uh, he heals two blind men, restores their sight, uh, and then he casts out a demon that, from a man that has been, been brought to him that's made dumb or mute, can't speak. And there's a sense in which all of these miracles are doing kind of the same thing that the previous miracles we've looked at, which is they reveal who Jesus is. They reveal his power and his authority, uh, the, the fact that, that he's, you know, God in the flesh. Uh, at the same time, they're doing something a, a little different at this point, because we kind of already know that. But what happens is we begin to see that how you respond to these miracles and how you respond to Jesus matters. And there's a parallel, there's a point being drawn between the relationship between spiritual death and physical death. And which, by the way, can also be represented, spiritual death can be represented by blindness and deafness. So all of these things uh, have a relationship to spiritual death, which is ultimately the problem that the Pharisees have. Uh, they were the ones that kind of end this string. We begin with uh, the ruler of the synagogue who, you know, doesn't have that, and they do. So they kind of contrast each other in how they relate to Jesus. So let's just kind of dive into this and, and see where it takes us. As we, we resume our story, Jesus is still at the party that was at Matthew, the tax collector's house, right? Uh, he called Matthew to follow him. Uh, they end up going to Matthew's house. He throws a big party. Everybody's there. They're eating. There's other tax collectors and sinners, and he does some teaching. He addresses some complaints uh, and answers some questions with uh, both the Pharisees and John's disciples, and after that's done, this guy comes up to him, and he's very distraught and in desperation, he just kind of throws himself down before Jesus uh, and tells him that his daughter has just died, and he's hoping that Jesus could do something about it. And so Jesus and you know, they get up and, and go with him. Now, it's worth noting that this man is, is a somebody, right? He's important. He's called a ruler. Uh, Matthew, always very brief, He's a ruler of the synagogue. That's, that's what's meant by this. It means that he's got some coin. He's got some wealth. He's got some status. Um, it doesn't make him a, a rabbi or a scribe, per se, a you know, formally trained teacher. Uh, but he's a big fish in a small pond, of, you know, Capernaum. At least he's a big fish there. And he's likely a Pharisee, or he associates closely with them. And the way you should understand the term Pharisee in terms of Israel, especially at that time, is it's like a political party. So he's a part of that, but like I said, he's not necessarily one of the, the, the high ups. But what he is a part of is the governing body of this local synagogue who's responsible for sort of the care of it and, you know, paying the teachers and, and so forth. Because again, he's got money. He's on the board. Jesus' disciples, they get up, they go with this ruler, but on the way to the house, this nameless woman just, you know, kind of sneaks into the crowd. And she has a problem. She's been bleeding for 12 years. This would be a, a menstrual bleeding process. It's like, you know, her period is going all month. And that means that, well, among other things, she's probably constantly anemic, which is a really rough way to go through life. But she's also, in terms of Israelite society and because of, of the law of Moses, 
she's permanently unclean and impure. And everything that she comes into contact with, even slightly, uh, is also becomes unclean and impure. This has likely been going since she hit puberty, which means she's either remained single or she's been divorced. She likely lives her life in complete isolation because no one wants to risk being around her or coming into contact with her. And on top of that, she's probably spent every bit of money she ever had going to doctors to try to get this problem solved, and they've not been able to help her at all. And so she's an outcast, and she's a nobody. In Israelite society, she is the polar opposite, if you will, of the ruler. And that's kind of how she functions even in the story. She has no standing. She's not important. She, she's also unproductive. She can't have children. She can't work. Um, everything she touches will become unclean, so she can't be around people. And unlike the dead girl, she doesn't have a rich father to intercede on her behalf. She's as marginalized as you can be. She might as well have leprosy, right? I mean, it, it's, it's about that bad for her. However, she's heard about Jesus. She believes that if she can just discreetly touch the hem of his garment, that, uh, that she'll be saved, right? She'll be healed by that. Now, to be clear, this is pretty much the definition of a superstitious belief, both then and now, right? touch the magic robe, and I'm, and I'm better. Uh, further, just to m- like make that much contact with Jesus would make him unclean. He'd have to go and wash his robes. He'd have to go wash himself, he'd, you know, so on and so forth, uh, just to be. So she's, she's not supposed to do it. And if she bumps into anyone in the crowd, again, same problem. So she shouldn't even be there, much less trying to touch him. But she manages to do it. Right? She managed to touch the robe, and Jesus notices. He turns around. And, right, what is he going to do? But amazingly, Jesus values this woman who's all but dead to society. Right? She has no value, but she, value, she, she matters to him. And he turns to her and he says, Take heart, daughter, which is a term of endearment. Your faith has made you well. And she's healed right then and there, and he sends her away in in peace and wholeness. It's like she has, really, she has a new life. She can now participate uh, in the world around her and in society. Uh, And this remarkable thing happens, right? Instead of her disease, her problem, her sickness, making Jesus unclean, his power makes her clean and pure, heals her. And What's more, the superstition actually gets transformed too because it doesn't just stop with the touching of the garment, right? He actually engages with with her. It's very brief, but she now actually has a a relationship with Jesus. He chooses to heal her. It's not like it just happened sort of technically or mechanically. It wasn't like even an injection of medication. But he actually connects ever so briefly, with this woman. And it's interesting, so the word that's translated here, made you well, your faith has made you well, if if it was translated more literally, it would be, it saved you. And that term in Greek, right, it it does have all those spiritual implications with it, um, more than just physical healing. Jesus then continues on to the house of the ruler. Since this guy is wealthy, there are professional mourners there. Uh, with some with flutes, some verbally weeping loudly, right? Uh, there are people that really did this as their job back then. Uh, and they get there, and there's you know, this huge crowd, and they're all doing their jobs, and Jesus says, look, go away. I got this. The girl is sleeping. She's not dead. Now, sleeping was a euphemism, just as it is now, for, for death uh, back then, but they realize that he's kind of soft, peddling the death, sort of, most, mostly dead, and they're just, they laugh at him, they're like, yeah, dude, we know dead, she hadn't been breathing for a while, or whatever, you know, they, they, they understand the physical signs of death, and ancient people dealt with death even more than we do, I guess, in a lot of ways, because people died a lot earlier and more often, um, and they know this, and they're like, 
<laughs> she's dead. But, of course, for Jesus, death really is kind of more like sleep. Death is what he came to overcome. And a few moments of ceased breath and ceased heartbeat are nothing for him. He's going to rise to eternal life after three days in the grave. So Jesus gets the crowd moved out of the house, all the mourners and everybody, takes the girl by the hand. She arises. Again, Matthew chooses his terms carefully. The word arise here is the same thing when Jesus rises from the grave. It's the exact same word. She's restored to life. And the story, as you can imagine, spreads very quickly beyond Capernaum to the whole district. Everybody is talking about this. In Mark's account of this story, at the very end, he lets us know something very interesting about the little girl that suggests that she actually has more in common with the woman that Jesus healed than her powerful father. He tells us that she's 12. At 12 years of age, a little girl like that would have been alive just about as long as that woman had been afflicted. And she is also a nobody. She's not yet married, but she probably will be married within a year. She's not yet a productive member of society, but she does have all the potential in the world. And what a tragedy it would have been for her life to end at just 12, just as that woman's life had been effectively ended 12 years ago. But as we can see, Jesus cares about both of them. And now they have both been restored to life. Do you feel marginalized and unimportant in your world? Like if you disappeared, maybe no one outside of your family would notice. Jesus loves you. You matter to him. You matter to his church, too, who care. He leaves, <clears throat> and he goes on from there. He goes on his way. Matthew doesn't, <laughs> he's so brief. He doesn't even tell us where he's going next. He tells us he's going to a house. We know he goes to a house. We don't know if he goes back to the party, right, the house of Matthew, or if he goes uh, home, which was probably Peter's house, may have been his own. But along the way to wherever this house he's going to, two blind men start following him and crying out. They don't tell us how blind men follow him. I don't know if they're getting help. Maybe they're just falling by ear. But they're crying out, have mercy on us, son of David, which is, of course, a messianic appellation. It may be a reference, actually, to Solomon, who was uh, reputed to have uh, the ability to heal people. But regardless, it, right, it's a way of calling Jesus the Messiah. It's not clear if Jesus is sort of ignoring them because he, he kind of keeps walking, or if he's just trying to get to where he can get off the street and away from public viewing before he helps them. But, you know, when he does get to the house, he goes inside, and the two blind men follow him in, and then he says, you know, do you believe that I'm able to do this? And they say yes. He touches their eyes and says, according to your faith, may it be done to you. And instantly, they can see. And then he does this funny thing. He does this a lot of times. In the, not, and not every time he heals somebody. He didn't do it, actually, in just the previous healing. But he does it quite frequently. When he heals somebody, he says, very sternly, don't tell anybody, right? <laughs> Which is kind of weird. And I always, in my head, I'm thinking of, like, I don't know, like, Ben Kenobi, these are not the droids you're looking for, like he's going to, like, restrain them with his mind powers or something. But, of course, that's, that's not what he's doing at all. Um, he doesn't, I mean, he wants to slow the roll of his fame, which is spreading quickly and becoming a problem. But Jesus never, ever coerces people. He never violates their wills. Everyone that comes to him to be healed, everyone, it, they, they come because they want help. They do so willingly. He gives instru instructions, right? He preaches forcefully. Um, and then, you know, they ignore him every time, and his fame keeps spreading. But that's, that's really the way he handles everyone. But at the same time, it's like, I mean, how are these guys even going to not talk about it? 
if you knew somebody that was blind and suddenly they were healed, you'd be like, hey, uh, wow, what happened? What doctor did you go to? <laughs> I mean, that's remarkable. You can see. I, <laughs> I mean, it's almost not even pa- possible for something this remarkable not to spread. And yet, you know, there he is. Don't, don't talk about it. Um, file that away for a second, but it, it is important, I think, that Jesus does not coercively force anyone to believe in him or to do what they don't want to do. Anyway, the two formerly blind guys, they kind of exit stage right, right? Remember, Matthew's ushering these things in really quick. And a man possessed by a demon is brought to Jesus. <clears throat> What's interesting, though, is that this demon has somehow rendered the man uh, mute or, or dumb. He can't speak. He may have been deaf as well. Uh, that's not the focus of the story, but the term that's used could apply to someone that was mute, deaf, or both, right? Because a lot of times those two things came together. And we don't know, uh, but the focus in the story is on the fact that he either can't or won't speak uh, after he was possessed by this demon. And I find it fascinating because... Um, a lot of times it's suggested uh, by scholars and other people that ancient people didn't understand the difference between uh, illness and possession, particularly mental illness, right? Uh, that they didn't necessarily distinguish those things and they may have confused them. Uh, and I, I, I mean, I suppose that's, that's certainly, you know, possible in, in some cases, but in this case, they can actually distinguish, and it's clear they distinguish, between Demon possession and illness, and illness that's caused by demon possession, which is a pretty remarkable amount of nuance um, when you think about it. Anyway, Jesus casts out the demon, and immediately this man is able to speak, and right, everyone is amazed. We, we've never seen anything like that. And all of this, when you sum it up, it's, it reads like a fulfillment of a prophecy of Isaiah chapter 34 where it says this be strong fear not behold your God will come with a vengeance with the recompense of God he will come and save you then the eyes of the blind shall be opened the ears of the deaf unstopped then shall the lame man leap for like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy but then like the whole thing ends with this kind of Debbie Downer comment right And, of course, it's the Pharisees. They're always the Debbie Downer in the story. And they say, you know, he casts out demons by the prince of demons. And to me, it's a bit of a baffling response in a way. Uh, Because even the ruler of their synagogue, who pretty much had to be their friend, at minimum an acquaintance, had just been blessed by Jesus. Surely you would have thought they could at least be grateful for that and it's interesting in their response they don't deny what Jesus has done right they can't deny that the world has literally been changed for the better by this that he cast out a demon but instead they still say that Jesus is the enemy he's evil I mean how how can that be And there's a sense in which this, this simple fact that they respond this way points to the fulfillment of another prophecy, also from Isaiah, this time from chapter 6, where it says this, Go and say to this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. And the Pharisees are the spiritual picture of each of these physically afflicted people that Jesus has just healed. They are the deaf and the dumb. They are the blind. They are even the dead. They cannot see Jesus for who he is. Why not? What's the difference? Well, each of these people had faith 
or they had someone interceding on their behalf who had faith. They believed that Jesus could heal them. It's not a lot of faith. It's just enough faith to make the effort to go to him and ask for help. It's just enough faith to give them that little bit of courage to seek out Jesus. And to be clear, it's not that faith that actually heals them, but it's the object of that faith. It's, it's Jesus. It's the person of Jesus Christ that heals them, that gives sight, that gives speech and hearing and life. And remember, Jesus heals, but Jesus doesn't coerce. So they come to him of their own free will, desiring the healing and the life that he has to offer. And the Pharisees simply refuse to do that. What about you? What do you desire? Do you desire life? Do you desire to be saved by Jesus? Are you willing to call him Lord, right? That's one of the recurring themes in there. The people that respond to him call him Lord. Are you willing to submit your life to him? He doesn't, as I said before, he doesn't come as a consultant. He comes as a king. Are you willing to confess your sins and believe that he died on the cross for those, that it was necessary for him to die for you? Are you ready to receive like that kind of grace and forgiveness, but are you willing to embrace the humility that it requires to do that? The reason the little girl's death is only sleep to Jesus is because he would indeed spend three days in the grave. It's a hot grave. It's Israel. Decay moves quickly in that climate. And yet, even with the decay, he was resurrected. Really, a, a miracle of a completely different order than resuscitating a little girl. There's nothing that Jesus cannot heal. There's nothing that he cannot make right. And all of our hope is in him. And if you can see that glimmer of hope, if you can believe that much to seek him, then you too can be saved. And that's the hope of the gospel. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the hope of the gospel. Open, open our eyes to see, our ears to hear. Let us rejoice as those that have been given a voice back and given life. Celebrate the truth that our God, our Lord, and our Redeemer has come to save us from this broken world and our broken lives. Lord, make this grace real to us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, let's now stand and in response uh, to the preaching of God's word, confess our faith with ancient words.